Buongiorno, I'm in Washington DC for the APA conference in this Washington. series of uh, interview after Anthony Scholli and Philip Zimbardo. Today I meet Elizabeth Messina. She's a psychotherapist in Manhattan and also she has a, a psychodynamic training and orientation. But today I interview you, Elizabeth, not about uh, psychotherapy right. or maybe a little bit, yeah. but more on your interest, your studies. You're a scholar of Italian American studies. You edited a first book when, in which year? In um, 2003. 2003, yeah. about. Italian and Italian American, American women. women. And it was interdisciplinary perspectives. And yes. But now you are editing another book about Italian American culture. The exact title is It's Italian American uh, History, Culture and Behavior. Uh, and oh, perfect. In particular we are interested focused on uh, the stigma against the Italian American culture. So the perception the bias and perception yeah. of Italian American in America. So, I, I let you. Uh, speak. How, you how told me that, that there are. How did that influence? How did that topic? What was my attraction? Mm. What attracted me to that was my own personal experience. Yeah. Uh, because I, my two of my grandfathers uh, mm. were, were Italian. One was born in Italy. But one was born in the United States in 1890, and um, the one who was born in the United States was un unusual for the cohort of Italian American immigrants at that time. Mm. He became a physician. Ah. So in the 1920s, an Italian American physician was an anomaly. And in order for him to succeed in his practice, he had to anglicize his name. Mm, from awesome. Rossi to Ross. <laughs> and um, his name was Michele, uh, but he used his middle name, William ah. Michele, with an M, only the initial, Ross. And he didn't fit the Italian American uh, stereotype of the physiognomy. Yes. Uh, he had red hair and blue eyes, which I now know from my study of history you know, was the influence of probably the Bourbon occupation of, of, of Southern Italy, um, the Germans back in the 12th century, etc. So his bloodlines uh, carried many threads of other cultures that, that were countries, nations, groups that at various times in history uh, oppressed Italy. Okay. So, so, you are, uh, so he handled the prejudice. He handled the prejudice firsthand. So in order to succeed as a physician, he had to hide his Italian American and Italian ancestry. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was, I learned through my mother, mm. uh, deeply uh, painful mm. because it, it took away who he really was, and it took away his knowledge of where he came from. And uh, a new, in a sense, classification of who he was was imposed on him by the power hierarchy. Hmm. It may seem uh, it's not so visible, it's very subtle. Mm -hmm. and. I don't know how conscious truly he was of it, but mm. intuitively he understood that in order to be a successful physician of Italian descent, he had to not appear or signal in any way that he was Italian. And he was your grand my my maternal grandfather. Maternal grandfather. Now but my father He did an anglicize. He did not. His name was Giovanni Messina. Mm -hmm. uh, he just anglicized his first name to John, yeah. but he kept Messina. And though that is, we know, the name of uh, 
a town uh, in Sicily. His family actually came from Campania. Uh -huh. And um, he was the second oldest of nine children. Hmm. And his uh, mother was ahead of her time. She came to the United States in 1905. She recognized that my father was extremely bright. And she also recognized that my father would never get a good education in the public school system in New York. Why? Because Italian, the children of Italian immigrants were perceived at the time, mm. helped along by psychology in the beginning of formal intelligence testing, mm. were perceived to be of borderline intelligence. Ah, yes, that, who, that's one of, yes, of the Yes, of brain. borderline intelligence who would not benefit yes. in high school from, a, uh, from preparatory courses that would enable them to attend college. So Italian students were automatically um, placed on a track for working class jobs. It was called yes. a vocational track versus an academic track. So my grandmother, after my father completed uh, uh, kindergarten and first grade, mm -hmm. sent him back to Italy uh, to, to study with the Silesiano, mm. Silesiano uh, brothers. Silesiano, yes. Silesiano yes. and as you know, it was an order founded by Do Don Bosco, who yes. was very active in, in the post-unification Italy, and his whole mission was to provide an education yes. for the poor and the working yeah. poor. Yeah, and it's so true. he attended uh, Liceo, Gymnasio, and University mm -hmm. in Italy. Yes, it's and true that Salesiani gave a very high level education. A very high level. Mm -hmm. And my father was there you know, on scholarship. Mm -hmm. He excelled. He skipped grades, etc. And he ultimately graduated from the University of Naples and became a physician. And then he came back to... And the reason he came back to the United States was in part because mm -hmm. his family was here. His family actually traveled back and forth between um, New York and Italy three times during the 1920s because his father never really wanted to stay in America. He wanted to, like most others, most other Italian immigrants, to establish, uh, to, to accrue enough money mm -hmm. so that he could establish a business in Italy. And um, he never succeeded at that. So ultimately, he returned to the United States. But my father remained in Italy. When he uh, completed his uh, medical degree, mm -hmm. what he found was that there was a caste system in Italy at that time, so that even someone who came from a poor working class family would not have a good chance of uh, developing a successful practice mm -hmm. because he was not from the right social class. Mm -hmm. So um, he was politically and socially enlightened and he made the very difficult decision to come back to the United States and mm -hmm. when he did, his Italian degree was considered to be suboptimal mm -hmm. and he had to then attend Columbia University to prove that he was truly uh, capable yes. of being a physician. And then he did his internships at uh, two Italian-based hospitals founded by, one was the uh, Cabrini Hospital, uh, uh, founded by uh, an Italian nun. Yes, I, A hospital for... Cabrini, yes. Yes, Cabrini. And uh, he found two other Italian-born physicians with whom he completed his internship. So, why am I so concerned about stigma? Mm -hmm. Because yes. I grew up in a family where I had a highly educated father who was highly knowledgeable about his Italian history mm -hmm. and culture. And uh, very, uh, unlike most American physicians, he had a tremendous intellectual grounding in the humanities. And uh, he had a double stigma yes. that worked against him. One was that he was an intellectual, and that uh, was something that non-Italian physician colleagues were threatened by, because he had a 
depth and breadth of knowledge beyond medicine. They didn't like that. And, and then secondly, uh, because he wasn't accurately appreciated or perceived for who he was. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one thing that he and my mother, who by the way is, is American born, but it was her father who was a physician, and my mother in the 19, um, early, well, 1930s, 1940s, uh, decided to study medicine. Hmm. And her father, who was the surgeon who anglicized his name, uh, was very encouraging of it. Her father was a surgeon, and she used to love to go to the amphitheater and watch her father do surgery. But what changed the course of her life was that her father died at a very young age, at age 48. And her mother, who was of Dutch and English descent, mm -hmm. uh, never uh, approved of my mother's aspirations because she had very Anglo-Saxon Protestant uh, values. And, and her value was that the worth of a woman was defined by marrying someone, oh, so. being married to someone in the upper class. So once her father died, she lost that very important support mm -hmm. to continue her education. And it was my father uh, in those days, which was like uh, 19, right up to the war, uh, 1946, uh, that when a physician developed his practice, uh, you basically purchased the practice of a retired physician and then you built your practice. Mm -hmm. So my parents met because three months after my grandfather died, my father, who had served in World War II as an army surgeon, for the United States Army, uh, wanted to open his practice. So he found the practice of my grandfather, uh, not knowing that he was Italian, or was Italian. And um, it was in a brownstone, and my grandfather's practice was on the ground floor, and the family lived on the upper uh -huh. three floors. So he bought a practice, he met my mother, and they married six months later. Mm -hmm. So you told me a, a story of real discrimination for this particular track yes. for Italian. Yes. So it was something bond. right. It's something that started. The, in, this discrimination lasted up until until his death. death. In other words, the, it, it was separate. subtle discrimination. Subtle, subtle discrimination. Yeah, but in addition to the subtle, there was a, a real, clear discrimination based on these pseudo scientific study about the borderline... Oh, yes, uh, borderline intelligence, intelligence. right. And this clear, not some right. discrimination lasted more or less... Through the 1960s because... Through the 1960s. Yes, because unlike all the other European ancestry groups who by the, the outbreak of World War II and, and post-World War II years, most all of those groups um, had achieved at least a, a college education, unlike Italian Americans mm -hmm. who remained skilled artisans and um, members of the working class. So sociologists, uh, first mm -hmm. we had the psychologists who, were, uh, who developed intelligence testing, and they were very interested, they were very, what the term is called nativism, when you privilege the, uh, those at the top of the power hierarchy, which were white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. And they, Lewis Terman was one of, the, uh, uh, one of the psychologists at Stanford University, mm -hmm. who developed actually the first intelligence test, Stanford Binet. Yeah. And actually, his ideas and the elements of that test uh, were uh, ones that he had extrapolated from Binet in France, mm -hmm. who ah, also yes. had yeah. developed intelligence tests for similar and somewhat different re the reasons, because the population in France had grown, the, the, the capacities of schools to accommodate the, mm -hmm. the increased demographic uh, was inadequate. So in France, they started through testing to sort out those who were going to benefit 
from a classical education, mm -hmm. and then they, uh, in France, developed schools for those whom they thought would not be able to effectively utilize uh, the educational system. And then, so, there was tremendous uh, uh, both aggression and fear mm. on the a part of the power hierarchy in the United States, which is to say, uh, those people who were descendants of Northern and Western European yeah. ancestry. And so they were privileged, and they were, America in general was very threatened by the Great Migration, the largest migration, as far as we know, in world history, largest migration of large groups of people yes. at any one particular time in history. And within the Great Migration, if it were the Italians who had the greatest numbers of anywhere from 10 to 15 million Italians emigrated to the United States between 1900 mm -hmm. In 1915. So Italian Americans uh, were particularly threatening uh, because of their numbers, period, mm -hmm. and uh, their potential to infiltrate eventually, maybe one or two generations uh, past the immigrant, to infiltrate the power structures. And you know, power structures will do everything to maintain power. So it all subtly, psychologically, sociologically, unconsciously. Mm -hmm. um, structures were developed to keep and repress and oppress Italian Americans and create barriers, uh, uh, create barriers uh, uh, that would prevent Italian Americans from uh, entering the power hierarchy. So, I mean, and so one of the ways they did it yes, was well, through what we call scientism, which is yes, using science for to, political end. Yes, to something suggest that they were borderline intelligence. They were borderline intelligence and therefore couldn't uh, uh, benefit from a college education. Well, of course, you can't enter, enter uh, professions or, or uh, any organizational structure if you don't have a college education. Mm -hmm. So again, they were considered beasts of burden, much as they were perceived to be in Italy, most suited for manual labor. And then yeah. the schools reinforced that by, uh, for example, in high school, most Italian uh, school children were put in uh, workshops to, to be taught carpentry, ah. to be taught plumbing. Yes. Etc. It's great. And you told me that this this level of stigma more explicit stopped in the beginning of the seventies. Yes, but 60s. it's important also to say that beyond the intelligence testing, there were very key mm. historical events that intimidated Italians mm -hmm. from challenging power structure. For example first decade of the, yeah. and part of this uh, first half of the second decade, Italian Americans were the largest group, only second to African Americans, who were lynched. They were mm. lynched in Colorado and the South. Well, there's nothing like being killed just for who you are. Yes. And, and to have false charges brought against you to rationalize the killing. So that's one way of saying, stay out, stay on the margins. Um, the next important event yes. was the uh, trial and execution of Sacco and Vincenti. Ah, yes. I know, I know. And they were uh, members of the radical, mm. transnational radical movement who uh, really became educated in the United States uh, through the various Italian leaders intellectuals, middle class intellectuals, uh, who came like Luigi Galliani, mm -hmm. uh, who came to the United States with a socialist, somewhat utopian idea that it, that it was the poor and working class who could um, turn over, mm -hmm. deconstruct the existing power structure and in a utopian way create equality for all men. So you can imagine 
the attraction that had for Italian immigrants who were already oppressed in Italy, criminalized in, in many ways. They were through, the, again, scientism of Lambroso and Giuseppe Sergi and the Piedmontese government. Um, and then that continued on into the, and then, so we had Sacco and Vanzetti, and that really uh, was the event mm -hmm. that caused the reception, re recession of the radical movement, the radical political movement. Uh, yeah. So that was the first attempt on the part of Italian immigrants to actually become political activists and to change the status quo, and to change the status quo of the marginalized uh, place of Italians in American society. And then during the interwar years, as you know, Mussolini came to power. He didn't have the support of a large majority of second generation Italian Americans, but he temporarily raised the hopes and spirits mm -hmm. of, of oppressed Italian Americans that um, finally Italians will be perceived as powerful yes. through Mussolini world leaders, and mm -hmm. we know what happened with Mussolini. He was disgraced, yes. discredited, etc. So that was the only, I, so the fatalism yes. uh, that, that helped Italians to uh, persevere through hundreds of years of oppression um, remained their main uh, fatalistic attitudes remained their, their, their main coping mechanism uh, to survive yes. and thrive economically, because they did begin to thrive economically uh, in American society. And then the, the uh, I'd say the final event mm -hmm. that uh, cemented the stigmatization of Italian Americans was during World War II, which as you may or may not know, was that, um, as you know, the Japanese, uh, who were considered obviously a threat mm -hmm. uh, to the United States, almost all the Japanese, even those who were born in this country, yes. uh, were sent uh, to, to the detention camps. Uh, but what a lot of people don't know is that Italians were, those of Italian descent, naturalized and non-naturalized citizens of the United States up until 1942, were also considered enemy aliens. And they had to evacuate from, especially a lot of the cities along the coast of uh, California, yes. because there was this fear, uh, it was an irrational fear, but nevertheless a fear, um, that they, uh, first of all, that they were uh, supporters of uh, Mussolini, the yeah. access of evil, and that somehow they would infil infiltrate and and uh, and obtain information that would then be fed back. Oh yes. Uh, yes, and so uh, not only did they have to evacuate, but they had to to wear tags, and they had to uh -huh. have their papers on them at all times. Because if they did, they, in other words, they could, they, their homes, their civil liberties were suspended, and their homes could be searched and seized at any time mm -hmm. for trumped up charges. And also, there were a lot of Italian women, for example, uh, who committed no crime. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if they, for example, were found, there were curfews placed where Italian uh, Americans were not allowed to, um, uh, to, to walk the streets after 6 p.m. at night. Mm -hmm. And so if Italian women uh, were shopping yes. and it was close to the curfew, they were sent to jail and they were kept in jail for a couple of days. So you know, these are techniques that have been used historically over centuries. Uh, to intimidate people mm -hmm. from challenging the status quo. Because if you do, either you're marginalized, you're sent to prison, and or you're killed. Yeah. Those are powerful forces. So then, after uh, the war, uh, with the GI Bill. The GI? It's called the 
I don't know what it stands for, but the GI Bill. Well, the GI Bill basically... Uh, a bill is a, a law. It was a law that um, provided yes. uh, financial support uh -huh. for veterans of the war to attend college. In other words, the GI Bill of Rights Yes. Okay. Uh, gave okay. a lot of working class Americans their first chance to afford to, to afford a college education. Hmm. Now, Italian Americans who served in the great Italian Americans served in in the large were the largest number of uh, Americans who were of European descent who uh, served in the United States Army. Yes. And uh, they wanted to prove their loyalty to the United States. And again, it was yet another attempt to be accepted as equal. Ah, yes. So, Italian Americans post war uh, begun to go, to go beyond their aspiration of completing high school, and many started attending college. But they, they lagged behind other European ancestry groups. Mm -hmm. We started attending college in, in, in large numbers in the 1950s. In the it 50s. was Italian Americans in the 1960s mm -hmm. whose numbers began to grow. Ah, yes. So, as they became more uh, well educated, they then had the possibility of climbing out of the working class and beginning their ascent to the middle class and the upper middle class mm -hmm. because of their higher education. Then came, um, but even though uh, many were growing numbers of Italian Americans uh, were able to complete uh, college, again, they weren't fully accepted as were the other European ancestry groups, the Irish, for example, mm -hmm. you know, those of German descent. And of course, the Jews had begun in the second, 20, uh, second decade of the 20th century to obtain uh, university educations because that's part of a long historical tradition of a thousand years. Mm -hmm. And the Jewish story is another story. But in any event, yes. Italian Americans were always being compared. Sociologists were always doing studies mm -hmm. of uh, European ancestry groups and looking at the demographics and looking at uh, their numbers in terms of uh, completion of college and higher education. And they always found and were puzzled by uh, why it was that Italian Americans did not pursue higher education. Mm -hmm. And their conclusion wrongly was mm -hmm. that Italian Americans were simply very practical people. I and they so. didn't consider that college would advance the uh, accrual of material wealth. That material wealth, um, there are many ways to obtain it, and one didn't need a college education yes. to do that. But that was just a rationalization. The real story from my perspective yes. is that because Italian Americans as students in the American educational system were overtly and covertly mm -hmm. perceived to be less intelligent mm -hmm. and less capable than every other group except for African Americans. It's like African Americans and yes. Italian Americans were both thought to be not so intelligent. And yes. so it wasn't just that fatalistic practicality that helped them survive post-unification and pre-unification it was the fact that they were, again, just as in Italy, discriminated against. Yes. Right? Both their, their characters uh, were uh, less well-developed, less, uh, less uh, suited for uh, uh, contributing to civic society. Uh, they were very individualistic, according to the scientists. They, they held values that uh, really impeded them from uh, making a solid contributions to improving and growing American society. So we have yes. in the large historical picture of the history and evolution of uh, so-called democracy, in, and it, yes, our democracy is flawed, but we do have a democracy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, with the limitation, but that is a democracy. Yeah, with limitations. So, um, 
So we have one, uh, the increasing numbers of Italian mm -hmm. Americans attending college and university. And then we had the backlash from the African American civil rights movement. Yes. And it was at that point in history that uh, Caucasians of all backgrounds thought it prudent to, uh, to become more inclusive mm -hmm. of all Caucasians, including Italian Americans. And historians of Italian American history have written about, for example, Italians were not white on arrival. They were always the in-between people. Mm -hmm. And it was only in the 1970s that they became fully white. And it was in the 1970s that yes. we had Mario Puzo, for example, yes. uh, write his book called his first and his, from a literary uh, critical perspective, actually considered his greatest work, which is called The Fortunate Pilgrim. Most Americans are completely unaware of, um, of, of that work, of this book. And again, like Barolini, yeah. it, it was a fictionalized story of the evolution of his family and their struggles in so the United the, uh, States. And you also quoted, let, let's say to the, to the Italian readership, that Helena, Helen Helen Barolini. Barolini was okay. the first, not the first Italian But the first writer. recognized Italian-American writer. And because she was the woman who actually brought to the attention of the public that she wasn't alone, mm -hmm. that there were many, many unrecognized uh, uh, Italian-American mm -hmm. women writers who were not promoted in the uh, public arena because of their last names. Ah, yes, the family. And um, publishers thought that their books wouldn't sell, not only because they had uh, names that ended with the vowel, because publishers thought that Italian Americans are, in essence, not intellectually inclined, Aye. and therefore wouldn't buy their books. Aye. Italian Americans don't read literature. Again, Italian Americans are practical. And so uh, Barolini, through her perseverance, and it took a tremendous about uh, perseverance, her first book, Umbertina, ah, yeah. like Mario Puzza, was a parallel, was, again, about her uh, own family history, mm -hmm. the evolution. In both cases, Mario Puzza wrote about his own mother, who was the matriarch, interestingly. Ah, the the women who became the leaders in their family um, to promote socially and educationally, uh, the advancement of their family's place in American mm. society. But Umbertina, which was first published by CU Press in the 1970s, basically uh, went unrecognized mm -hmm. uh, by the mainstream uh, critics. But then, in the 80s, when she published her anthology of Italian-American uh, women writers, novelists, and poets. Barolini. Barolini. Uh, yes. She very successfully uh. publicized and got her book out into uh, the mainstream. Mm -hmm. And then, because she succeeded in doing that, then the feminist press at the City University of New York became aware of her of first this. novel, Umbertina, yes. and they republished it. And then it it, it, it then reached a much wider audience. Mm. But Barolini's background, if I just made that uh -huh. a moment, what's important to know about Barolini's background mm. is that she was born to a middle class family in Westchester. Yes. But she married, an, I think it was an Italian journalist or writer. And. Uh, you don't remember the name? Oh, of goodness. No, Barolini was his last name, mm. and uh, they married in the 1940s. This man? And she was college educated, uh, which was unusual for a woman of Italian descent at that time. And what she found was that just as she was marginalized in the United States, she was marginalized in Italy because she was Italian-American. Ah, uh, yes. And Italian-Americans were perceived by Italian intellectuals to be not particularly intellectual. So 
Yes. Uh, she was perceived positively as long as she was in the company of her distinguished husband. But she was not in his company. She was just a woman, an Italian American, and not particularly interesting. Yes. Interesting. And so uh, she lived in Italy for at least 15 years. Baroni. Baroni. 15 years. I mean, occasionally they traveled back for business to the United States. But, but for the first 15 years of her marriage, she lived in Italy. And it was, she didn't, because she grew up in a, a middle class, upper middle class community in Westchester, she didn't feel the sting of stigmatization or marginalization. Uh, but she felt it for the first time in Italy. Ah, yes. This is it. And uh, also, during those 15 years, she developed an interest in tracing her family roots. Mm -hmm. And she found, she actually went to, on her own to visit the uh, birthplace of her grandmother. And she started to gather information about her grandmother oh, and her yes, great grandmother. Yes. And so you, she wrote the. Finally, uh, she the liberated novel. herself mm -hmm. both from this uh, traditional patriarchal yes. uh, uh, marriage. Mm -hmm. Where and, uh, she was the handmaiden to the intellectual, and uh, she liberated herself and became a writer and intellectual um, that didn't require her to be married or to be known uh, or defined by yes. her husband. And uh, so she did a tremendous service for Italian American writers mm -hmm. and women writers in particular. But there are other less known, less well-known women, like Daniela Giuseppe, mm -hmm. who preceded her, and uh, she was, is still alive, a great writer, a great poet, and uh, she was one of the first Italian American <coughs> writers who both wrote in the mainstream American uh, press and also wrote about her Italian Americanness mm -hmm. in her poetry. She also taught and wrote a book about prejudice, and not just about Italian Americans, yes. but about prejudice among and uh, between a number of groups mm -hmm. in the United States. And she, in fact, was a mentor to Barolini, so ah. she's been marginalized and only now in the last five years has she been recognized and by the Italian-American mm. uh, scholarly community. Her name is Daniela Giuseppe. Giuseppe, G-I-O-S-E-F-F-I. -F -F and she too was born to a father who was a chemical engineer. Mm. And though he was a brilliant man and he worked for a very famous company because he was Italian-American, his accomplishments were never recognized. So she too, in her own way, was propelled by a similar mm. family history where I knew how brilliant my father was. Okay, and all the things, and I think many of the things are in this editor book you're going to... So, what to, this to, book, I'm editing the book, yes. uh, the ti working title is called uh, Italian-American History, Culture, and Behavior. Yes. And it's interdisciplinary volume, and it's interdisciplinary by necessity, mm -hmm. because to just use the lens yes. of literature, just to use the lens of history alone, or sociology alone, does not give a true comprehensive yes. picture of the trajectory of the Italian-American history, experience, and acculturation, and adaption to the United States or in the United States. Also, the book addresses uh, the stereotypes in the media, mm -hmm. starting uh, with, we have a couple of very good chapters, you know, analyzing why it is that uh, writers and, and, and directors Screenwriters, as you know, Francis Ford Coppola yes. adapted his screenplay based yes, on that, that, Mario Puzo's book. Why did Mario Puzo 
write a book about the Godfather. I'll tell you why. After that, the first After the first fortunate pilgrim was not fell on deaf ears. And, and so his the, publishers the is, told yes. him, if you want to succeed yes. in the mainstream, you've got to write about the mafia. It's the only reason he wrote about it. So He, he was, had no personal interest in it. He had no personal experience or connection to the mafia. But he had to feed his family. He had to earn a living. And it was a huge success. And then the same thing with Coppola, by the way. Yes. He's, a, he's really a very uh, a brilliant filmmaker. And he, too, was marginalized in Hollywood. And um, the powers that be in Hollywood brought him together with Mario Puzo and said, can you adapt and mm -hmm. write a screenplay based on Mario Puzo's book? And as you know, Godfather 1, 2, and 3 are the only three films that Francis Ford Coppola will be remembered for, even though he's written and produced uh, many other yes. fine films, but he'll never be remembered for them. Now, I think what Coppola did, and why his films are so complex, is that yes. the films aren't only about the inner workings of the mafia. Mm -hmm. What he did very subtly was to uh, reflect or represent the Italian-American culture of the family and mm. the extended family, and the dynamics yes. in the family, and especially most importantly, uh, uh, yes, yes. protection of vulnerability to the outside world, which required allegiance and loyalty. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course then, in, a, in a, a, a violent way, if you violated those codes, he, oh, okay, if, he viol if one violated those codes, uh, the way in which he dealt with that was to put that in the context of how the mafia operated. So as psychologists, as you know, uh, there's a great emphasis always on the individual, as if the individual and their family story and their narrative exist in a vacuum. In social psychology, they look at the person in context. In the book that I'm mm. editing, uh, I'm placing Italian Americans and their narrative in a larger historical context so that one can understand on one level uh, what, what were the political and historical dynamics that uh, create the fertile ground for Italian Americans mm -hmm. to be stereotyped right through the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And of course, they've been stereotyped through the most popular media, of, um, of, of television and uh, of, of technology. Um, the, the burgeoning of technology has now allowed not only what was uh, privately contained in the United States to become global. It's not just in the United States that, are, that Italian Americans are perceived to be, to use Italian words, caffone and uh, 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 sort of yes. ignorant and uh, vulgar, uh, this is still uh, a very uh, dehumanizing, very dehumanizing yes. of our culture when we, in fact, have a very rich and well-developed culture, uh, both on the level of our social and community culture and structure and identity, but um, also on an intellectual level. We have a lot of very distinguished uh, intellectuals of Italian ancestry. Now, of course, most of them aren't focused on uh, any aspect of their Italian-American identity. And I would make the argument that, in part, uh, that's because they had to keep that away from public view in the academy because it might undermine, and it definitely did, uh, to recently undermine their chances of uh, rising up in the hierarchy. Yes. But now, uh, Italian Americans, there's a cadre of Italian Americans that in some way, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of W.E. Du Bois. He was a famous African American 
It's Wexler right, yeah. in 1910, 1920, yes, who right. began to write about the history of slavery, but beyond that, how to transform uh, the African American community uh, in such a way that they would begin to be integrated into mm. American society. And he had a famous phrase called the talented tenth. And what he meant by that was that the, the, even 10 African American intellectuals could become leaders in the African American community to A, raise the consciousness mm. of. Uh, of their internalized oppression, not just yeah. the obvious external oppression, but the internalized oppression that, that um, led them to believe that they were inferior. And so too now, uh, 100 years after the uh, immigration of Italians to the United States, we are developing that uh, uh, talented tent of intellectuals mm -hmm across disciplines who are, through their writings, their public speaking, um, and their research, raising the consciousness through their intellectual works of uh, the history of Italian Americans, and also uh, to create a much more in-depth understanding of why we are where we are in American society today, which is to say, even though we have the highest median income of all European ancestry groups, even though at this point we have the highest number or percentage yes. of Italians who uh, uh, obtain graduate or, mm -hmm. or uh, graduate level, PhD level uh, degrees, we're still being represented in the media as working class mm. and uh, crude and vulgar collectively, a collective uh, yes. group is crude and uh, And it, it's only when we start to become public mm -hmm. and make it known to the public who we are uh, that we will begin to find our rightful place in American society and, ch and achieve, for the first time, a measure of social justice. Okay, this is a very interesting, maybe in future, we make another interview about the connection of, with the, the Italian environment. Uh, Absolutely. I, I, I thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. Unfortunately, we have okay. finished the time, and I greet Elizabeth if you want to greet the readership. Oh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, I'm one of the co-founders of the Italian American Psychological Society. And our, uh, we have several missions, but our major mission is to encourage research and writing about Italian-American culture and history in the United States. And we as psychologists have our own perspective in terms of the human dynamics and the unconscious dynamics that are the basis for prejudice. And we can use our research and writing to uh, penetrate uh, negative public our perceptions, and also to bring to attention to the public the fact that our, our there's an Italian word mm -hmm. or phrase called la cultura negata, that our, mm -hmm. our culture has been invalidated and yes. negated, and we are in a position to begin the process of, of allowing our culture to become validated mm. in uh, American society. Thank you. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>